I'm delighted that the Migration Museum is able to host this evening's event, along with our partners, University of Adelaide University Collections and the Confucius Institute. We begin all our events here at the Migration Museum by acknowledging that we're gathered on Ghana country. We recognise Ghana people's ongoing connection to country, uh, and I might say that that was marked recently by a successful consent determination of native title. Um, and we pay our respects to Ghana elders, past and present. With no more ado, I'm going to hand over to Mona Herrick, who's going to talk briefly about university collections and this series. Good afternoon, um, everybody. Um, there's lots of familiar faces here, people that we've seen at other events. Uh, but from our perspective at University Collections, and for those of you who haven't come across us before, um, our job within the University of Adelaide is to make sure that we wrangle about 43 collections of various kind of apparatus, artworks, um, gifts or anything you can imagine we have somewhere in one or, one or two collections perhaps. Um, so in it, our work is really concerned with preserving that cultural heritage of the university that has come out of teaching and learning uh, that has been happening on this site for over uh, 135 years. Um, and to do that we organise a series of events that give us an opportunity to discuss some of the things that the university is concerned with within its academic field. Um, and to get in this time, we have partnered with Confucius Institute. And I'm delighted that we're doing that because our unit has been in partnership with the CI since the beginning. And I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled to see Emeritus Professor uh, John Tappan with us today, who was the first patron of the Confucius Institute. Is that the right word for you? Well, close, close. Yeah. So uh, it is through him and the, uh, that we started being more involved in the operations and various projects that we did. This is really the first time that we reached out of the university and seized the, the wonderful opportunity of the Centurion exhibition and the, uh, trying to tell the story of the Chinese people in Adelaide and beyond that we've partnered uh, with the Confucius Institute, Migration Museum, and as you can see on the panel, we have an um, art gallery representative as well as um, uh, Alfred Huang here as a community member, but also somebody who has contributed a lot to, um, to the Chinese diaspora that's here in Adelaide. And of course, Amy Dale, who is the curator uh, of the exhibition. So this for uh, Dr. Ning and I and, and our teams, uh, we thought this was a wonderful thing to come together and I'm absolutely delighted uh, to see people um, come in such numbers. Everybody come on their Eventbrite ticket, which is wonderful, <laughs> uh, but also that everybody's early and we are ready to start and, and get on with it. So thank you so much uh, and thank you to our teams in both the Confucius and uh, University Collections for all the work that we put in to be here today. I will hand over now to Dr. Ning Zhang to be our host for the afternoon and Ning is the interim director of the institution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, again, I'd like to acknowledge the collaboration between the uh, South Australian Migration Museum and the University Collections for this wonderful event. I'm sure this is the not, and this is sort of a beginning, but we did a lot of collaborative events before, but the Migration Museum is the first time. I'm sure it will be more to come in the years to come, or if not this year, right? Um, John, Professor John Tappan, you mentioned John as a patron. Actually, John is so modest. <laughs> you are more than a patron. You are one of you are the funding person for the Confucius Institute. 
under your leadership, is the Computer Institute really developed very well from well to strong, and uh, now the um, the CI is uh, having the second ten year, uh, uh, the second of ten year to develop and to grow from, and uh, we are very well established at the university and the communities now. And uh, we focus on the learning of the promotion of learning Chinese language and understanding Chinese culture. So today's event is one of the events that we like to hold. And uh, if I'm sure you will enjoy today's event. Uh, before I go on, maybe I just have a, a, a few more words about Confucius Institute, what we do. Uh, within the Confucius Institute and, also, and in the communities as well. We actually, this year, we have about close to 30 programs or projects. We get to ask, can you do all this? There would be no slides, but that's how it goes. Can you just see if I can ask? Can you do something Can we have a slide? Oh, let's see if we can do something. Excuse us, can you do Year we hold about three or four Chinese uh, China briefing talks on um, different topics about China, political, economical, economics, culture, social development, etc. etc. And today we name it uh, a China briefing as well. It's on um, uh, culture, on migration, so it's all China related as well. Uh, Confucius Institute also works closely with schools, so we have school programs. We support schools in the form of culture workshops. We actually reach to about, some years we reach to 4,000 person times at schools, the school children uh, for the culture workshops, like uh, calligraphy, uh, painting, paper cutting, martial arts, etc., etc. And the school kids love the, those workshops. Actually, our volunteers, they just they rush back from the workshop somewhere else. So they really, they just done a wonderful job this afternoon and they rush back to this event to support us. Um, writing competitions and um, Chinese speech contest, so held nationally and internationally. We send our winners to China to compete internationally. And the last few years, our South Australian school, uh, school students did very well. They got to top 15 in the world, and both university students and the school students as well. Uh, testing of HSK, which is called Han Yu Shui Shi, Chinese Proficiency Test, at different levels. Confucius classrooms. At the moment, we have two Confucius classrooms, and the third is about to launch this year. And the school principal's tours etc etc um, just name a few people's time um, we also work alongside with local government business communities and cultural institutions to promote chinese culture and arts including chinese new year celebrations chinese uh, chinatown street gala um rather more celebration rather more last year we had a big how many days three days of celebration over the Chinese New Year time. Uh, Alsatia festivals, uh, we heavily involved and we are sponsored for the Australian festival programs. Uh, actually, last year we were involved with the South Australian Art Gallery for the art exhibition during our 10th year anniversary celebration. And school holiday programs at local uh, council libraries and so on. The Institute also plays an important role in supporting the universities like our Chinese language teaching programs at the Department of Asian Studies, supporting study tours to China, not only in students doing Chinese program or Chinese language within the university, but also students doing other courses such as the School of Health Science. At the moment they are in China, we help them to provide a section of Chinese immersion program there. So the our university students get uh, uh, just experience what Chinese culture is in the depth. 
and providing translation and interpreting services, supporting overseas Chinese students' programs and activities, and uh, also supporting academic exchanges and the university executive training programs. So that's why we have close to 30 programs and projects each year. We're really very busy. Okay. Now, myself, I'm a migrant. I came to Australia in 1985 and, uh, as a student. And then after I finished studying, I got a job here. So I, I came to elevate and have been academic. So um, I have grown, and um, I think I have grown a lot since I was a, a young lady about 30 years ago. And, um, and the witness and experience the development of South Australia, um, how migrants contribute to the communities in this South Australia and in Australia as well. My role as the uh, interim director of Confucius Institute really gives me a lot of chance in that path. Apart from that, I also served as the president of Asia Pacific Business Council for Women for two years, uh, about two years ago. Now I'm also a member of the South Australian Ethnic, uh, Multicultural and Ethnic Affairs Commission. So it's a big role for me. I, I look forward to making more contributions to the communities. As, um, so that's about me. Now let me introduce the first speaker, Amy, Amy Dale. So Amy is a curator at the Migration Museum. She has previously worked at the University of St. Andrews and Museums Galleries, Scotland, and has postgraduate qualifications in museum studies. Amy co-curated the exhibition of Sin Chun in there, you'll see these wonderful exhibitions there, changing the <coughs> with Natalie uh, Kapora. Uh, I've been there many times. I took my Chinese new migrant friends there, and actually my friends very impressed there, and to see how the Chinese, the early years, how Chinese migrants contribute to the economy in this society, especially under the white policy um, in that kind, in, in that area. I think it's more difficult than what we do now. So now let's welcome Amy to give us a talk. Hello everyone. Um, I do have some really nice slides to show you and I don't know if it's going to be the same without um, because we all spoke about preparing a talk that was mostly a PowerPoint talk. Oh, we oh, we're just... Um, yeah, oh, now that I haven't, I haven't actually started. So maybe if anybody would like a top up of their drink. Well, 
know, and I haven't got a prepared speech. I just say a few things about, I believe, related to the topic today. The exhibition and white Australia policy, maybe that's the word. Uh, but before that, I would like to thank Adelaide University, University Collections, Confucius Institute, and particularly Migration Museum for hosting this event today. And thank you for inviting me as well. And also I'd like to acknowledge uh, the heritage uh, Ghana people of the land here in Adelaide. So that's part of the formality. And uh, I think it is something that some of us every day, now and then, come across uh, the word white Australian, the words. Uh, for me, because of my age, I think not many Chinese came to this country before the 60s, with the exception of the earlier, the previous century, the gold rush time. Since 1901, the white policy was adopted by the government, the federal government, and the Chinese population in Australia actually went down. And by the time I came to Australia, 1965, uh, really the number was very small. I don't have any figures here, but look, reading what is written there in the exhibition, talking about countries, maybe. Uh, I actually went to Melbourne and I was one of the earliest so-called international students. And uh, we were living, my family was living in Hong Kong. So I came to Australia as an international student, a university student. And so I've been living in this country ever since. But the one experience I had been different to the subsequent migrants, Chinese migrants, because when I came here, officially, we still had the white Australia policy. So I look at this uh, from two different aspects. One is a government policy. So that was the white policy. But then I look at in the community. I was in Melbourne. I don't recall those years I had any experience of being treated differently you know, as a non white person, as a Chinese as such. Uh, so my own experience those days was you got on one hand government policy and then you have the community attitude. And the government policy of course, as we already know, uh, in subsequent years started in 66, 67, then to the 70s, gradually being removed from government official policy, white Australia. But interestingly enough, I never experienced the so-called white Australia maybe attitude or maybe discrimination from the time I was a student and subsequently working. And uh, even though, looking back, most of the uh, 
people I work with, not almost all, work with or classmates in universities, they were all Australians and uh, very few Chinese or Asians. So I'm saying that is because later in my life, when Australia, in my view, in a lot of people's view, we have, over those years, become more multicultural. And more, or Asians are more easily accepted in the community, in the society. But that's when I experience the so-called anti-Asian, anti-Chinese uh, things that happen to me. I'll come to that. So uh, I must say that as a Chinese Australian, so I've been here how many years now? 50, 53, 53 years. And I don't normally think I'm a Chinese. And most people I deal with, I don't normally show that or express that, no, oh, you are a Chinese. No, you're just another person. And I still believe today Australia is the most multicultural country in the world. I've traveled over the years to many other countries, to Europe, to Asia, to the States, America. And I'm saying that is because I believe my own experience and experience of people I have spoken with, associated with, that discrimination is not a usually a, a issue in Australia. Australia is a very welcoming, friendly country, and migrants have always, over the years, been welcomed, and in a way, contributed to the society, to the country today. I'll give you one experience I had. Well, I was Lord Mayor here in Adelaide, 2000, I think it was either one or 2002. There was a French delegation came to visit Australia, came to Adelaide, and a group of, they're not government officials, but it's a cultural group, group of just people, ordinary people from France. And then they visited town hall, and I had a little reception for them. And of course, there's a lot of chatting and, and talking. And um, halfway through, there's one uh, gentleman in the hall. So more or less, so pulled me aside a bit and uh, asked me the question. He said, "I have noticed that you are." He didn't know how to put it. That I'm not an Anglo-Saxon Australian. <laughs> you know, you're different to me. You know. I said, I understand what you, you say. He said, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to ask you the question of uh, how did you become mayor of the city? And uh, I said, well, Lord Mayor of Adelaide is always elected by the people of Adelaide, the voters in the council area. So it's a direct election. He said, were you born here? You grew up here? I said, no, I wasn't. I was born in China. I came as a student. He said, oh, that, that's, that really surprised me. He said, in France, I don't think you'll get elected. <laughs> I mean, I was so surprised to hear that. And I know, I've been to France. I believe France is also a fairly inclusive sort of a country. But that, to me, I believe, said by somebody from another country, 
that is really a good reflection of our multicultural society. Because on top of that, not only directly elected, it's not a compulsory election. So you vote for somebody, most people would only vote or vote for that particular person, whoever that might be, if he or she believes that person is able to do the job. And the majority of them. So that, to me, is a real good reflection of our multicultural society here, most inclusive society. But talking about bad experience, I had one standing out very clearly always in my mind. 1997, first time I stood for election as a candidate for Lord Mayor. And for those, most of you might not think 1997 is just another year, but 1997 was the time Pauline Hanson got elected to Parliament in Queensland. To me, that's, you know, he, she, sorry, she was elected. No argument about that. But because maybe influenced by the media at that time, so we started to hear sort of negative comments about migration, Chinese migration. And my experience was I had an election office in the city and one day I had a phone call from my office. I was out there campaigning that better come back quickly. So I went back. There were about 50, 60 demonstrators outside my office with banners, slogans, Chinaman, go home. We don't want a Chinaman as a man. Lord Mayor of Adelaide. I mean, that's okay. We're, we live in a free country. People are entitled to express their views. But the people who helped me in my office got a bit scared when some of these people tried to push their way into the office. And some of them could look a bit scary, as you know, you know. I'm not against these people, but for people who don't know them, could look, you know, the, the bikey types of costume and tattoos and so on. And so the people in my office got scared. So I came back, and uh, of course then police arrived and so on, and uh, nothing really bad happened. So I thought that's the end of it. It wasn't. A week later, I had it all my windows, doors smashed, and I had slogans painted on the wall, China Man Go Home. So that was very scary for me, for my family, because we never experienced violence like that in Australia, particularly a city like Eden. And uh, luckily, not, nothing more serious happened. And, and uh, so that was my one experience. But what I'm saying is, in every society, in every community, we have different views about different things. As long as we peacefully express our views, I think we can accept each other's difference. And that's why the strength of multiculturalism, that we live together, but we work together. We make a contribution to the community, to the society together, even though our background is different. So that is many, that was many years ago now, and uh, I have uh, uh, since recently retired.
during my life. But also, I still tell everyone that, particularly after a trip outside Australia, whether I travel to China, to America, to Europe, to Southeast Asia, I come back here, I always feel, yes. <clears throat> this is my home. I'm sorry, my old age has become very emotional. <laughs> Well, I'll say something a bit more, uh, less serious. Came here as a student 53 years ago. I'm talking to a lot of the young Chinese people here. Like all of you, I had a Chinese dictionary, Chinese English dictionary. So when I think of a word in Chinese, I don't know the word in English, I look up the dictionary. And of course, over the years, because of my work and years I spent in Australia, gradually that book never used. Until I start, started lecturing at University of South SA, they asked me, would you like to lecture in Chinese, I thought, wow, that's my first language, no problem. All right, so they decided to send me to China, to Singapore, to Hong Kong to lecture. But after I said yes, when I started preparing my lecture notes, suddenly I found I wasn't equipped to lecture in Chinese. In English, no problem. I <laughs> had <laughs> my lectures, my PowerPoint, all in English. Because over those years, 40 odd years, was between the first arriving here and the time I was asked to do this, my Chinese started to, yeah, I can communicate, talk. But then, when I had to prepare lectures, I was lecturing management theories and business strategies, leadership. Everything was in English, not in Chinese. Some of the terminology, I, I wouldn't know that. And, and so I went and searched, got my own dictionary out. <laughs> This time, it's the other way around. <laughs> and look up the English, see what is in Chinese. And that's how I managed to prepare my lecture notes and PowerPoints in Chinese. So, it is something you used to, you get used to. And uh, so, coming back to the Xinchun exhibition, I have been to the old shop many times, particularly during the time I was on council. And uh, of course, the Sintun family already, uh, I think, sold out their business. And uh, Geoff Chapel was the person who bought and ran the business. I think he's still there. I haven't seen him for a while. And I was always interested. And the one thing I asked the question today to, to the organizers of this particular event, I said, Sin Chun, it doesn't sound Chinese. <coughs> Not that doesn't sound Chinese, doesn't sound like a Chinese surname. <coughs> Say for instance, my surname is Huang, so my Chinese name is Huang Guo Xin. So surname in the front, given name, middle name, and given name. But of course, English names were the other way around. So 
and ask, does anybody know where the Sim Chun? The name is the real name that people can hear. But so far, I don't think we, we got the answer yet. So we'll let you know next time when we find out whether that's the real name. So I think my time's already up. I was even only talking about <laughs> <laughs> keep going talking about other speakers. <laughs> and we have time for questions. Well, I'll finish here. Maybe we we'll later on if we have time and we, we can do a bit of uh, exchange of views and questions. Thank you very much for for coming here and I'd like to again thank the organizers and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Enjoy the wine. <laughs>
which is his exemption certificate from the dictation test. Um, and on the reverse of the document um, are John's thumbprints. Um, they previously um, did full handprints, um, but when John had his certificate done, they were doing the thumbprints. So John was um, a lowly hawker, but business was good and uh, he did well. And the family moved to the east end of Rundle Street in 1906, opening a shop called Sim Tune and Co. And John continued to sell fruit and vegetables and nuts and that sort of thing. Um, the Sands and McDougall directories of South Australia show that this was the first um, that this first shop was right next door to a prominent Chinese businessman called Wei Li. And um, you may have seen in the exhibition that beautiful plaque above the door that's gold um, that relates to um, Wei Li and Wei Li's achievements in South Australia. Um, and John's original shop is just a block away from the location we know today. So who are the rest of the Sim Tunes? Um, John died um, in 1922, so he died quite young. And so um, his wife, So Young Moon, and his four children carried on developing the businesses. Um, so we have um, So Young Moon, uh, oldest um, son there, uh, George. Um, and then we have youngest son there, Gordon. Uh, this is Dorothy, um, who's in the middle, and then Gladys, who's younger than Dorothy. Um, so, um, by 1928, all four children were running successful businesses. George, the eldest son, standing there behind his mother, um, managed uh, the original Sim Tune and Co. And Gordon, the younger, sort of spunky brother, uh, Gordon's a bit of a cad. Um, I don't go into that today, but we can chat later. Um, he was known as the king of fireworks, selling the latest fire tops, golden zodiacs, and snowstorms uh, in the run up to Guy Fawkes Night. Um, uh, which is held annually, was held on the 5th of November here in Australia. Um, Gladys and Dorothy set up a shop together, uh, the China Gift Store, the wonder store of a thousand surprises. They showed Chinese wear, lingerie, embroidery, ceramics, um, to the newly emerging flapper markets and young women like themselves. Um, here, I just have to include these because they're so gorgeous. These are um, cinema slides for advertising in the cinema. Uh, you can see there that that's advertising the fireworks, and there's advertising the uh, nuts um, available at the China gift store, uh, pickled ginger, um, that sort of thing. Um, here's a portrait of Gladys, and we have Soya Moon, uh, Gladys, and Dorothy there. Um, in the 1920s and 1930s, Australians were becoming increasingly interested in the rapidly modernising China, and the Sim Tunes used oriental imagery, including dragons, lanterns, in their newspaper advertisements and cinema adverts to successfully market their wares. Um, objects in the Migration Museum collection hint at how colourful the China gift store must have been, how luxurious the stock. In an interview in 1991, now held in the State Library collection, Gladys commented that um, I had very lovely things um, only the wealthy could, could afford, very exclusive things. Um, Gladys also reflects in that interview that um, she said she never experienced discrimination herself, um, unless, uh, in, apart from when she was leaving and entering Australia at the border, and that's when she felt um, discriminated against because uh, she looked Chinese. Despite their growing prosperity, the Sim Tunes, like all other Chinese Australians, found themselves affected by the restricted le legislation. The Immigration Restriction Act of 1901 formed the basis of, of what became to be known as the White Australian Policy, designed to exclude migrants mainly from non-European countries, particularly China. And the Act burdened Chinese people already living in Australia with considerable red tape when they travelled overseas and that's um, what the exhibition um, tells in terms of the Sim Tunes. They all had to apply for exemption certificates from the dictation test, and this certificate enabled them to leave and re-enter Australia without being subjected to the discriminatory dictation test, um, which could be um, given, conducted in any European language. Um, so, yeah, very effective tool. Oh, 
this is on display, um, you probably can't read it, but um, in the center of the lyrics for the song. Whenever I um, look at this, I'm like, those are portraits of men on the wrong side of history. <laughs> Looking pretty pleased with themselves. But in the middle it says, um, I think the lyrics say something like, a white Australia protected by the white man's guns. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you can YouTube it and even listen to the, the melody online. Um, so, uh, just to sum up, Gladys managed the China gift store after Dorothy left in 1930 when she, um, when Dorothy married and moved to Tasmania. Um, sorry, I'll go back again. Dor Dorothy married and left the shop quite early. Gladys continued running it for quite a while. And then when Gladys herself married, um, she um, appointed local people to manage the store and return once a year um, to oversee uh, until she retired in the 1970s. And then the business passed to her daughter, May and Neil, who opened the exhibition for us. Um, so May Leng um, ran the shop for quite a while. In a similar manner to Gladys running it, she, she was remotely based and would come back and oversee things, check that everything was running good. Um, the business finally closed um, in the mid-1980s, but Gladys's name lives on in the fashion emporium now on the site owned by Geoff Chapel. George's, George's businesses wound up after his death in 1960, and when Gordon died in uh, 1964, his son Basil took over the shop until uh, changes in fireworks legislation saw its closure in 1974. Um, I found some great archival footage of Basil speaking about um, the sweets and things that he sold in the store, which was just gorgeous. Um, the Sim Tunes were unique in Adelaide in their popularity, visibility, and charisma, and owned and operated some of our city's most memorable retail businesses. From humble origins selling fruit and vegetables from a hand cart, the hardworking and successful Sim Tune family have left an indel indelible mark on Rundle Street. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. I think you satisfied some curiosities from the floor, or maybe some more questions to come. So we'll leave all the questions at the end. Now we'd like to invite uh, Rusty, we call Rusty, Rusty Kelty to come. Uh, to talk, but um, do I need to say something about you? It's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> we got to know Rusty last year during our 10th celebration of the Confucius Institute. Uh, Rusty actually is a very uh, knowledgeable about Asian art and very good to work with. Very handsome, some people say. <laughs> <laughs> very intelligent, so a good partner to work with. So Rusty is the Associate Curator of Asian Art at the Art Gallery of South Australia. In, in 2015, he co-curated and co-edited a catalog for Shirtle Ships out of the Age of Spices exhibited at the Art Gallery of South Australia. Now, uh, Rusty is, um, well, you completed an MA in Art History at this university. Yes. And now you have begun your PhD at Monash University as a, what, uh, what's it called? Uh, external. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> yeah. yeah. So you have found a, a supervisor at this university, right? So you go to Monash University. But that's fine. Okay. Um, <laughs> 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 okay. I think, um, yes, um, until last month, right? Until South Australia, you 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 put on a, a China uh, yeah, China exhibition, World. China the World exhibition, fascinating stuff there. I I don't know whether you all been there and uh, they look really nice. There are lots of exhibits. Even I I asked our Chinese friends and my friend Francis come over, and they they asked me, are they real? Are they real stuff? So I passed on the friends to Rusty. Actually, Rusty got very much offended. <laughs> And also because they are not barred and not protected in China exhibitions, you know, in the in China all all these exhibits will be barred, will be, you know, highly secured mm -hmm. and uh, with a heavy security and you can't reach. But here you can touch the bus, but you're not allowed to, right? <laughs> <laughs> you can frown on that. Yes. But 
just confess once I'm such a like that. Okay, now, that's me. Well, first I want to thank, uh, of course, the Migration Museum, the University, and uh, the Migration Museum, the University, and anybody else. That's about it, okay. And Ning, of course, for inviting me along. It's, it's uh, you know, a great pleasure to, to present uh, this exhibition or this group of displays that we put on for the last year or so, uh, from 2017 to 2018. Uh, for about six or seven months called China and the World, which happened in, just as a happy accident along with the Sin Chun exception. So it seemed like we're all thinking about China. And what's very interesting is actually before this talk, I was talking to my colleague, uh, Jin Whittington, uh, sitting over there in the corner smirking at me. Uh, and what's fascinating is we're actually coming upon reaching a bit of a, a high watermark with the Colors of Impressionism show. And she reminded me, I think quite aptly, that uh, long before Colors and Impressionism, long before many of us were here in the 70s, there was a great China exhibition which absolutely destroyed all, all records of attendance at the art gallery, which if you can imagine in the 70s, the demographic of the population would have been quite significantly different and less. And so the interest in China, uh, you know, pervades Australian society. And I think, you know, the Sim Chun exhibition, uh, as well as China and the World to a certain extent, kind of really elucidate this, this interest in China, as well as the, the importance of Chinese culture that spread throughout, uh, you know, largely the world. Uh, there's hardly a place in the world where I think you can't find a Chinatown. So it's quite an important identity throughout Asia, particularly uh, not just culturally, but also uh, in many different ways. And so myself and James Bennett, the curator of Asian art, uh, decided that we would, a, a year ago or so, put on a China exhibition in the lower galleries. First, this started out as a China and Southeast Asian exhibition. Then it started out as a China and Islam exhibition. Then it was, well, China proper, China the Middle Kingdom. And then we said, well, let's do China and Europe while we're at it as well. And so this one room display turned into about four rooms, uh, which we didn't exactly know how we were going to fill up or what we were going to put in them. But we thought this was a very interesting idea to to uh, traverse. And so the four rooms were downstairs Melrose Wing, uh, galleries, galleries 19A, 19B, 20 and 21. And we started out with maybe uh, a bit surprising that we started with China and Southeast Asia. It's often not fully elucidated, but China's impact in Southeast Asia is prolific. And many of you may know, or some of you may know, the Peranakan cultures where Chinese diaspora, sometimes from the Qing, sometimes earlier, were forced into Southeast Asia and then um, integrated with local indigenous populations to create a culture that was somewhat obviously influenced by China, but also changed and morphed into something quite different and quite unique. And so we really wanted to portray this as much as our collection would allow, uh, the influence of China and Southeast Asia and these Peranakan cultures, as they're called. And this was done no more successfully, I think, than with these fantastic altar cloths that aren't from China, but were created in, in Java, uh, Indonesia, on the north coast and in central Java, um, through the using the batik process, which we so identify with Indonesian people and Indonesian art. Now, when I look at these, I see, of course, on the left, uh, this altar cloth, four lucky uh, symbols, uh, as well as dragons chasing the pearl, fortuitous, bats and phoenixes, or quilin, kind of uh, playing in the sky, and then on the right-hand side, uh, comparable images. And so for me, looking at them, and not having studied a great deal of Southeast Asian art, I immediately think, oh, these are Chinese for sure. But it's also, it's really important to remember that Chinese populations were living in Indonesia, particularly the north coast of Java, where there was great merchant communities that took, that developed, and traded in that great, obviously, the Indian Ocean and global trade, but within the Indonesian archipelago as well. And so China's influence is not only on its own, uh, you know, within its own borders, uh, as they are, but also outside of them, and particularly in Asia, throughout Asia, China's been uh, hugely important. The second room we titled China, the Middle Kingdom, as, uh, you know, China often considered itself uh, a kingdom upon itself, uh, and, um, 
where culture and um, where culture was king, and everything outside of it was, to a certain extent, not part of that culture or took part in it in some way, form, form or fashion. So we titled the Middle Kingdom. Now there were many works of art that we were kind of eyeballing in the collection uh, for this for this display, and the set of four panels depicting the eight immortals um, came out uh, for the first time in many, many, many years. They were collected in probably the 1970s. Uh, they were given uh, by a woman known as Agnes Asta Cameron, whose descendants have subsequently contacted me. And, and uh, I haven't met with them yet, but they want to talk about their grandmother who gave these. And they're fascinating. They, have, they depict the eight immortals, but they're by a well-known artist named Wang Qi. Now, Wang Qi is an interesting artist because he came right at the end of what's known as the Qing Dynasty, the last dynasty of, you know, the, the run of dynasties, Ming and then Qing. And the collapse of the Qing Dynasty is really an end of an era for China um, in many ways. And it ushers in, to a certain extent, the modern world and the modern era. Now, of course, many of you may know Ming, blue and white, Qing enamel, uh, you know, porcelain, of course, from China. Uh, was one of the most important global commodities for about 500 years. Highly desired in Europe and everywhere else. And still the patterns today, you can pick up a Harris scarf and David Jones. Uh, now this artist, Wang Qi, was right at that period when the, the imperial kilns in Jingdei Zhen were, were collapsing and there was no real market for them. And this new market uh, for the modern world was opening up. And so this artist had a very good idea of how to create and how to create, you know, fine porcelain in, the, in an imperial fashion. And then he also started to integrate ideas of Western art as well. He's one of the first kind of artists that, that traversed these two very interesting uh, paradigms. And so I've been looking at them in our stores for many, many years and thinking, how can we possibly display these, these fantastic works of art? They're amazing. They're amazing works of art themselves and just their history is fascinating. And so we had them out, and this was a perfect opportunity to do so. Now during this time, we invited over a, a ceramic scholar named Albert Nguyen from Western Australia to come and take a look at the collection. And these were sitting on a, a large, um, just a large area kind of covered up. And we uncovered them, and we say, said, Albert, what do you think of these? And Albert's about 60, and he, he kind of stepped back for a moment. Now we thought he might have a heart attack, but he said, oh, I didn't know you had these. And we were quite stunned. We had always appreciated them. We'd always thought they were fantastic, but we never thought, you never think grandiose thoughts sometimes about things that, that are in the collection. And he said, you know, these are fantastic. In China, much smaller versions of his work go for a very high amount. There, he's regarded as one of the seminal artists, you know, that, that bridged this, this imperial and modern history of China. And I said, oh, that's great. And then a couple weeks later, he sent me this image now this is a set of four, uh, very similar to Meal the Rose uh, panels made by Wang Qi. And I have to, you know, before I tell you any more of the story, I have to say that any work of art that comes into the gallery is considered valueless other than insurance terms. And is, uh, you know, we set them on par, they're all equal, you know, like our children are all equal. Of course, we love some more than the others, but nonetheless, the, the value is, is not relevant to us only in that manner. And he, Albert said, I found these online. They were recently sold at Sotheby's. And I said, oh, that's very interesting, Albert. He said, do you know how much they went for? And I said, oh, you know, maybe fifty, sixty thousand dollars 60000 He said, no, they went for $1.8 million US dollars. And I said, well, that's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> this makes these panels, um, you know, probably one of the most valuable works of art in our collection. And so Wang Qi, uh, I was also talking to uh, a Chinese artist, uh, Wang Fei, who was here a couple weeks ago. He was he was working with one of our local artists, and he said, oh, you know, Wang Qi became very famous about 20 years ago. His, his output was reassessed, and his work was reassessed, and people are really interested in his work in China, uh, as well as abroad. So it's always fascinating to me to see what is in the collection, what people were collecting in the 1970s and 80s, and how that impacts today's uh, trends and styles as to what's being collected. Now, of course, in Gallery 20, um, we couldn't not to put out a Jifu or a semi-formal robe, which you see in the middle, as well as these spectacular uh, cloisonne peacock feather fans, which once would have been part of a grander display, probably with some form of sitting, either a chair or a desk or something 
for that, from quite somebody of quite high standing. Now what's interesting as well is, uh, as similar to the four panels, is the collecting of Adelaideans throughout you know, the last 150 years. Uh, there has been a persistent and pervasive interest in China. Uh, all things coming out of China, anything that the collective Adelaideans have loved. And you have to always remember, you have to put this in context, that in the late 19th century, Adelaide was one of the wealthiest places, not in Australia, but in the world. The agrarian wealth had begot amazing mansions uh, throughout South Australia and great collections. And so we're very happily surprised when uh, these two peacock feather fans came out of a local collection, probably of about 100 years. Uh, we were a bit worried because we looked at them. They were such high quality and they were so beautiful. Uh, both James and I looked at the bases and we looked, we both looked and we counted the claws and we both breathed a sigh of relief and realized there weren't five claws, which means an imperial, you know, imperial provenance, which is, you know, very <laughs> problematic in many different ways. Uh, the center as well, the center of Jifu, or the semi-formal robe, is the treaty. And that it probably was created in the late 19th century. And so it was probably never worn at court, per se. It was probably created for an export market, probably created in southern China, and then sent or sold to some European visitor, or possibly sent to Europe and then made its way to Adelaide. So this idea of collecting things is quite important. And the final gallery, we had a gallery dedicated to the influence of China, or Islam on China, or Islamic motifs um, or aesthetics, as well as culture. The final gallery looked at the interaction with Europe and Australia and China. And some intriguing stories, anecdotes, and musings came out of this gallery, and that's how I should have titled this talk, was Anecdotes, Musings, and Outtakes, and the Future. On the right-hand side, you see this very, um, a portrait that actually was in the collection for quite a long time, passed down through generations of an Adelaide family. It was created by an artist known as Lai Fong, who was active in the late 19th century. It was probably painted in Calcutta, India, not China, not Australia. And then we believe that it actually is uh, an Adelaide sea captain who ended up probably in Hong Kong or somewhere in India. Uh, and his portrait was painted and it was passed down through the generations. Similarly, on the left-hand side, this, this cabinet that came out of the South Australian Museum, we borrowed from them, um, was actually brought back from China in 1914 by Reverend, Re Reverend Wesley Smith, who was uh, quite a known commodity in Adelaide at the time. And then on the left hand is this rather large and imposing uh, Balasar vase from about 1850. Now, <laughs> an interesting antidote goes with this, as, as, as many of the objects are. Uh, one day I, I received a call from a, uh, an elderly lady, an older, a mature lady, so, um, in the hills, and she said, I have this very interesting vase. Would you like to come up and look at it? Now, we often get calls about, you know, have somebody has the missing Michelangelo or David or, you know, Picasso in the attic or something like that. Of course, you take it with a grain of salt and go and have a cup of coffee and talk about the work. It's always interesting to see what's out there. And so I went up and I saw this magnificent vase. And the woman and her husband were just like, oh, yeah, it's, it's been in the family for ages. And, you know, there's some cards and some cigarette butts in the, in the bottom of it. I said, well, we might have to clean those out, but it's great for the collection. That's, Let's take it. She said, well, yeah, we'd love to give you the counterpart to it, but that's, that's part of the disgruntled part of the family's collection in Melbourne, so we don't think we'll actually ever be able to, to pair them back together. And then she went on to tell me this amazing story. She said, you know, my grandfather was working in Shanghai around the, the turn of the century. This is the 19th to the 20th century. He was a merchant of sorts in Shanghai, and then he traveled to Britain, then to Perth, and then to Adelaide. And so he carried both of these baluster bosses, as you can imagine, must have been an exceptionally arduous task, uh, all around the world in the, in the early 1900s. And what's fascinating about them, and I don't have high uh, detail photos, is there's actually staples of two different kinds, probably about 100, 200 staples, um, actually holding the boss together. And so it's not only uh, an icon or a uh, memorial to this journey that this family's boss had taken, but it also represents this, this time-honored tradition of repairing things with staples, as opposed to tape or glue or something else. And so it's quite a fascinating object. Um, you know, our lab, the conservation uh, group that do all of our work, did a fantastic job uh, putting it back to, to kind of uh, doing some minor work on it to 
make it look great. Andrew's sitting in the front row. So thank you, Andrew, to all your staff. Um, so this leads us to the futures part of the talk or the discussion. After the China and the World show, I think a, a couple of our colleagues, particularly in Australian art, who are doing the, the rehang of Elder after Colors of Impressionism, said, oh, there's, there's really something interesting about this China thing in Australia and what you guys have done. Maybe we should think about doing something like this in the permanent rehang in the Elder Wing, which all of you know is the oldest wing in the gallery. It's the first wing in the gallery, dedicated largely to Australian art. So it's very happy for me, as well as my colleague, to know that from probably December onwards, there will be a presence, particularly of the you know, Chinese diaspora and Chinese art in the Elder Wing, as it should be, as well as the Indian and Japanese. And so we're finally getting to a point with the Sim Chun exhibition with Ephraim's experiences in China, with Ming, uh, with, in Australia, with Ming's experiences here, that we're starting to integrate not only our artworks, but our way of being with people who have arrived here you know, subsequently or so to speak. On another note, while we're in the Gallery 20 looking at um, many different objects, uh, one day, and we have we host many different people that come to the gallery and want to look at things. We just happen to have on this China the World show. Now, I couldn't really speak to them because I don't speak Chinese, I speak Japanese, but there was a very able translator who was speaking all the time with them. And I said, well, what do you want to see? And they said, of course, we're librarians. We want to see the oldest book you have. And so I showed them the, uh, the, uh, this book that was created around 1500. That's one of the oldest books in creation. talks about world history. And then I said, well, the, you know, we have this great China and the World show downstairs. Why don't I go show you some works of art down there? And out of the 150 works of art in that show, in those four rooms, they picked out probably the smallest work of art that absolutely nobody had picked out previous to them. And they just lost it over it. And it happened to be this very small ink cake from around 1690, dated 1695, Kangxi Reign, uh, which actually displays the Buddha, Taoist immortals, the sun and the moon, and on the back has this amazing inscription. And so it reminded me that why are we collecting these works of art? Well, we're, we're collecting these works of art to remind us of who we are, who we maybe will be, but we're also collecting these works of art because they talk about and speak about a, a context and a culture other than ourselves. And in Chinese culture and East Asian culture, ink cakes would be used to make ink, which would then be used to write, would be used to make pictures or calligraphy, and are a symbol of, particularly writing is a symbol of who you are. It's your character, writ large. And so for most people walking through this gallery, all they see is a small lump of maybe clay or something that's black with a bit of gilding on it, but for them, they could totally understand what this meant in Chinese culture, how old it was, and how important it was. And so the librarians from the Shandong province, this is Li Yonghui, uh, Deputy Director of Shandong, Shandong Public Library, we became fast friends. Even though we couldn't speak a lick of Chinese or English, I think we hugged at the end. And, I, and from this conversation, um, I, I came to know that they were actually putting on an exhibition in the State Library of some of their oldest books, uh, which is coming, I think, in September. And I said, well, you know, we have this fantastic depiction of Zhuangzong's journey around the Buddhist world, the ninth century Chinese monk who wandered around India and the Buddhist world and then came back through Dunhuang and essentially uh, gave to the rest of East Asia Buddhism. Uh, and we have this amazing depiction of his journey, which is actually uh, uh, one of 13 copies, all of which are held in Japan, other than this one, which is in the gallery's collection. And so I said, you must have a book of Xuanzang's journey. Now, you all probably know uh, this journey as monkey, uh, monkey magic, uh, which played on, I believe, Australian television in the 1970s. And she said, yes, we have a thousand-year-old copy of the journey. It's the oldest book in the collection. And we said, I said, well, why don't you borrow this from us? We can put the book with this amazing journey, and it'll make a fantastic exhibition for you know, part of your display. And so this is going to happen. This is all because of the China and the World show and many other wonderful anecdotes which I won't share with you tonight. But you know the importance of these displays and dealing, uh, talking about Chinese culture and engaging with Chinese culture is that you never know exactly where it's going to lead. Uh, and particularly, you know, Australia's engagement with China and Asia is so important right now that it is, it is equally as important that we understand at least a portion of it or some of it. So thank you very much. Wonderful.
all the recipe. And so you can see, uh, actually, each culture has this unique uh, culture. <laughs> and uh, through the engagement exchange, people learn to another culture so that they can reflect on their own culture and then learn more things and uh, shorten the gap and uh, uh, fill the gap and uh, strengthen the mutual understanding. So that's what Confucius Institute is doing. Uh, that's our mission. I'm so glad today's uh, talks and uh, uh, so wonderful. But now uh, I'm open for questions. Uh, so um, how do we work with the question and answer? Do we have a mic? Or? Uh, no, we'll have to speak up. Uh, okay, so. Oh, the, Oh, yeah. But the question will direct you to a particular speaker. So I stand here. So any questions? Okay. Uh, first one? Yeah. Um, I'd just like to say to Dr. Huang, uh, you're like a good South Australian wine, you get better with age. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was really a very heartwarming and uh, quite an emotional talk that you gave. And I think that um, it's a uh, wonderful thing that's been recorded. Uh, and I would like to be including that uh, in the lectures for my students at the University of South Australia. I really appreciate what you did today. Thank you. Do you want to respond or? It's a confidence. Which is too rusty. Um, uh, I was looking just online at the uh, Art Gallery of South Australia website, but I can't find any record or you know archive of the material that was on uh, in the uh, China and the World Exhibition. Uh, yeah, look, um, it will be up there at some point. They're obviously dealing with a number of other exhibitions. It's a bit of a time lag before that information goes online. So, right. but you know, the more the more that you um, make your voice known and interest known, the probably the faster it'll get. So, uh, yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? No more questions. I can see the State Library people here. So, uh, when are they coming, the Shandong people? Uh, September. Well, Early yeah. September, yes. Yeah, we had a meeting together before, so we'll be involved in this wonderful project. So, looking forward to it. Yes. And that piece of ink, really, you know, Chinese scholars, when they look at a piece of ink, you know, the more, more, more yen. Oh, that's a part of their life, mm -hmm. and they are so, so attached to that, especially it's so old, and uh, you know, Chinese people love old people things, especially they grow, their value grow. That's why I, my friends ask those exhibits whether they are real or not. They are very, very precious. They can sell for lots of... <laughs> hopefully, hopefully <they're> <laughs> <laughs> okay, any more questions? Okay. Thank you very much, um, speakers. It was uh, wonderful to hear stories from personal to kind of global. Um, my question is really to Amy, and I'm just interested about uh, the Sintrin family, and I know some of them were here, and we were talking about the exhibition we actually bumped into people visiting from interstate family members. So would you be able to give us a little uh, summary of what they're doing now and uh, how they feel about the show? Um, so one of my challenges in the run-up to the opening of the exhibition was to try and memorise the Sim to like family tree and work out who the who the hell was related to <laughs> whoever I was. I was like, oh gosh. Um, so, um, three of the Sim Chun children went on to have their own children. Um, George didn't have any children. Um, and um, they all had quite a few children, two or three children. Um, and so there's quite a lot of them. Um, and um, yeah, as I said, um, Gladys's daughter Mei came to open the exhibition, which was wonderful. But I also had um, a descendant of Gordon, who was the youngest son, come in two weeks ago and donate some items. So um, Robert Simchun came in, and he was—he's the son of Basil, who's the son of Gordon, 
and um, he found Gordon's savings book, which was really cute. So, and it says Gordon's from June on the front. And he um, he found a stamp with the dragon symbol on, so he donated that. And he also has a whole box of fireworks that haven't been opened. <laughs> and so I phoned up Art Lab, and I was like, "Can we defuse these fireworks and make them safe?" They said they're going to get back to me. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So um, the response from the family has been really, really positive. Um, I was a little bit nervous because, you know, an exhibition that's focused so tightly on one family, you know, um, the, the spotlight's shining right on it. Um, and they've just been, you know, so, like they brought in all of like, the little, little descendants have come in and they're like, this is your, your history here in the museum. Yeah, we saw them when we were organizing this, we went to the museum and we saw two ladies there and one from in the state, one from local. The local one had a little baby. Yeah, they, they are so proud. I could see them by the way they talk. They're very proud of it, yes. Mm. Other questions? Actually, I have a question. Okay. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I really need this, but Amy, um, did you get any sense of uh, what Adelaidean society was like when, you know, you, you said in the 1930s that none of them seemed to experience any racism? Um, was Adelaide, did you get a sense of what Adelaidean society was like during that period and if it uh, different to today's or kind of, could you talk about that at all? Um, I'm quite new to Adelaide, I've only been in Australia four years, so I'm fascinated of hearing people's stories about when they used to shop in the Simtune shops. I like lap that up when people are like, oh yeah, I went there, or you know, my parents used to take me. Um, so, I forgot the question, roughly. Uh, <laughs> just the context in which they were, yeah. what was Adelaide like? Yeah, so... Like, for example, were they one like anomaly, or was there a broader Chinese? There was a broader Chinese community, but I think um, the Simchuns were singled out as celebrities. Um, and by the time you know the children were running the businesses, um, they were very affluent. Um, they received a good education. They travelled the world. Uh, particularly, I'm particularly interested in um, Gladys and Dorothy because um, you know these are young women at age 18 are running and setting up really, really successful businesses. Um, going to China, buying the goods, dealing with the whole side of the business. Um, so, um, yeah, and you can see that um, they're, when they pose in the photos, they're often wearing their Chinese clothes. And then in their you know, family photos from their trips, they're not wearing, um, you know, they're wearing the height of 1920s fashion. So there's that photo of Gladys, and she's there dressed in that gorgeous 1920s outfit and um, we've got other photos and she's there with her brother Gordon and he's just dressed so sharp um, and there's this other photo when the two girls bob their hair um, so one's got the really long hair and one's chopped it all off into the 1920s bob and she's pointing at it and they have got the scissors and so you can see that these two women are um, you know becoming very fashionable flappers you know they're totally going for that 1920s flapper thing. Um, so, um, yeah, I found that really, that the, all of the children interest me, um, but, you know, Gladys and Dorothy, what feisty women they must have been. Talk about the weddings. Oh, the wedding. My colleague Corinne always speaks best about the weddings, because she's got a great memory for detail. But um, Dorothy married first, and uh, she married at St. Peter's. And um, there was a notice in the newspaper saying the marriage is going to take place. And what they didn't realize was the number of people that were going to turn up. So the full streets were lined, and the wedding party couldn't even get in. Um, it was just chaos. And everyone wanted, everyone wanted to get a glimpse of this glamorous oriental bride. Um, and they, um, they mixed you know, traditions in the, in the ceremony, so they had um, a Christian wedding ceremony, but then there were elements of Chinese um, wedding, um, yeah, in the evening receptions and things. They talked about all the decoration, and they were a little bit more prepared for it when Gladys got married. So they knew, okay, right. So they they had a police escort for, for, for the wedding.
party. Um, yeah, so it really was a complete sensation, and we have um, Gladys's wedding dress in our collection. I had to make some tough decisions because I only had one costume display case. Do I display the wedding dress or that really nice turquoise number? Um, I hope you think I made the right decision. <laughs> uh, there is a photo of, of both weddings in the exhibition. I noticed there's a one photo about their staff dressed up in the Chinese yeah, costumes. That's awesome. Is it? And you, and they've, they're all dressed up and then they've got these peanuts on their lapels. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, and you're like, what are you doing? And, and then Gordon's at the front dressed like this sort of nut devil. <laughs> and he's holding this like thing and he's got this like horns on his head. Um, and the sign says Simchun Almonds. But then, um, yeah, and he's holding arms with Sadis, and she's there in a, in, I, in my mind, it's a black and white photo, but it's very similar to the turquoise garment. I don't know what colour the garments were that the ladies were wearing. But in my mind, I always imagine it's turquoise, it probably wasn't. Um, and then she has her shop assistants all lined up with their partners as well. And they're wearing the Chinese costume. But you can tell it was slightly adapted for them because they've got way too much ankle showing. <laughs> the, um, the, the, yeah, the much taller um, yeah, white Australian shop assistants. So yeah, that's a crazy... I stared at that photo for ages, like, what were they doing? <laughs> yeah, that was a very, very interesting yeah. photo and yeah. a very good photo. Yeah. The same as now, right, the Westerners, that was the fashion, Oriental style, isn't mm -hmm. it? I dress up today particularly for this occasion. I bought it from China. Okay. Um, talk about the white, uh, white Australian policy or discrimination. Uh, I agree with Dr. Wang, and um, even we, when we came in the 1980s as a student, at that time, uh, I came in Adelaide in 1989, right? Um, there are not many Chinese people here. And my supervisor, uh, Professor Huang, Yan Qing Huang, he said when he was a student in the 1960s in Canberra, there's even not even one grocery, Chinese grocery shop there, right? And, uh, but in 1989, when I came here, you go to Random Mall, you, you don't see a lot of Chinese faces. Um, I don't remember experience.